Okay, so what you're doing here this week, bliss, as you can tell from like the heating on the handout that you've got. There you go, you can have a look at that. So what you're doing here, bless, that's what it says. So, so far, right, we've been looking at the purposes of why we're here, of like why we exist. What has God done, you know, to, to create us and to make us and, and why? You know, just why? All right, so, so far we've been looking at uh, some of the purposes where actually there's not a lot that we can do ourselves. There are more things that God kind of does for us and in us. Uh, so we've looked at God created us to love us. Just to love us. Because he wanted family. Yeah? So he wanted people just to love and to like care for and to have compassion on. and You know, just to be a father towards. So he made us for that reason. He made us to belong. Okay? So that we belong both to Jesus and both to his church. Okay? So we have a place. And we also looked at that week. That the fact that if you belong, okay, you actually have a, a higher uh, chance of, of living longer as well. Because you belong to a group of people that share common interests. So being a part of the church, we all belong to the church. We are like individual pieces of a body or bricks in a building. Okay, both analogies that are spoken of in the Bible. Uh, last week we looked at that God created us to become, right? so that we are to become the people that he's created us to become. Essentially, that we are to become more like Jesus. He created us for that reason. When he created Adam, Adam was a perfect man. And that's what humankind was, was made for, to, to live perfectly in, in holiness and righteousness. And as we all know, that you know mankind sinned and like we've carried that, DNA nature all the way through history to this point. However, we are still called to be people that will become like Jesus. And it is a journey. And we are on that journey together. And I encouraged all of you guys, as Paul encouraged the church, you know, if you don't know what you're becoming, follow me. Follow me as I follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that, you know, together we will, we will become more like Jesus. As we grow in our faith and maturity, and you know, so those are the three things we've looked at so far. This week we look at something which is less about us, actually, but it's more about those around us. We look at that God created us to bless and to bless others, and you could also say that. To bless others, okay, we could phrase it another way, alright. To bless others, maybe what we should be saying is, God created us to live our calling, yeah. To live with the gifts and the talents that he's put within us to enable us to go out into all the world and to live a life that satisfies us but helps others, yeah. To bless others. And this subject, this one subject of what is it that God's made me to do is possibly the biggest stumbling block for any Christian. I think this is the one thing that actually most people struggle with in church. From people that have grown up in church to people that are brand new to church. We all hear inspirational messages every week that Go on and be all that God's created you to be. Go on and do what God's called you to do. Go and read your Bible and go and serve the community. And we hear a lot about serving and doing and being. And we're like, but what? What? What am I supposed to do? What is the thing that is for me? Yeah, all right, I get it. Together we can go out and do stuff. If we're being like led by a leader of a ministry or something, we can go all go out and do this thing. But what is it that I am supposed to do? What is my ministry? And it's not about just my ministry, but God has called each of us to be individual and to do something that only we can do, actually. So, I think this is one big thing 
the Christian people actually really struggle with. So, when I was growing up, when I was little, I didn't want to be like most other kids. My guess is that most of you guys, when you was little, like proper little, you wanted to either be a doctor or a nurse or a vet or a policeman or, you know, a kind of, a kind of thing that, that helps other people, yeah? I'm not saying each and every one of you, but on the whole, yeah, most people want to grow up to be in a job that will just help other people. Because I think that's an intuitive thing within us. We, we naturally just want to help people as kids. And as we get older, we, we discover that actually, you know, the world system teaches us, well, we need to look after number one. We need to look after myself first. I am the most important thing. But that's not God's way. So for me, growing up, I, I didn't grow up wanting any of that. All right? I was, I, I've always been a bit weird. I still am a bit weird. But growing up, what I wanted to do is I wanted to be a waiter on the QE2 ship. Seriously? I wanted to be a waiter. I wanted to go around serving right, dinners and meals to people on the most luxurious liner in the world. That was my dream. That was my ambition as a kid. I used to, I used to dream of that. And you think, mate, what is that all about? And actually, it was only a couple of years ago that I, I put the pieces together. That actually, back then, God had put dreams and desires in my heart to be the person that I am today. Because now, today, the thing that I get the most joy and the most satisfaction out of is having people around for dinner. Right? Me cooking for people and like sitting you down and being like, yeah, sit down, blah, 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 blah. have some of that, have, have a good jolly up. Right? That is, that is just who I am. And that's always been who I am. But I didn't get it until recently that God had put those desires in my heart from such an early age. So that's me. That is part of the reason why I'm on the hospitality team. Last week, I briefly spoke about the fact that before uh, I, I started to, to be in the youth and involved with you guys, I, I, didn't, I wasn't bothered about... You know, I was bothered about you, all right, but I wasn't bothered about being involved in youth ministry or anything like that. That wasn't, you know, my my thing. I thought my thing was, you know, to be the hospitality team leader and you know just stuff like that. But about seven years ago, when I was working for KFC, we used to get loads of youth come into the KFC and just sit down and hang out. And I discovered back then that actually I had this weird kind of affinity with them. Because, you know, I'd clip them around the head if they misbehaved and chuck them out. And the next day, they knew they could come back in and, like, sit in the dry and stuff again. If any of them were, like, in trouble, and a couple of times it happened, they were being chased. And I'd let them through, and I'd, like, run around the back, and we protected them from getting smashed up. <coughs> around about that time, when I first became a Christian, God put a dream in my heart to like, open a youth cafe or, or something of that sort. A place where young people can come and have a place of sanctuary, a place of getting away from trouble, a place of peace, a place of refuge, right, where they can come and eat and just, just be. Yeah? And God put this dream in my heart and I wrote it all down and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all through my Christian life up until last year, I didn't think that that and this were connected at all. But actually, right, the whole serving thing, wanting to be a waiter and the hospitality stuff, the whole youth cafe thing idea, man, it's it's not it's not there yet, but I know that I can see it happening right in front of us right now. I think, man, it's amazing. I couldn't have, you know, made it happen. I couldn't have orchestrated it. So we're called to bless, right? Because God puts things in our hearts to use. So let's have a look at the word bless on the outline, all right? I looked it up in a dictionary. It says it's to consecrate or sanctify by a religious rite, make or pronounce holy. A lot of big church words there. It says to request of God the bestowal of divine favour on. It says to bestow good of any kind upon. To extol as holy or glorify and to protect or guard from evil. So all of those things and the examples that they give there, 
are ways that you can use the word bless. Well, I think actually most of them really narrow down into number three there, which is to bestow good of any kind upon. I actually think they all kind of fall under that as a, as a general kind of header. So to bless is to bestow good of any kind upon. So, the big question that we're going to try and answer tonight is, are you a contributor or are you a consumer in God's church? Are you someone that just comes on a Sunday, sits on their butt, sings a nice song, listens to a message, goes home, does nothing with it, struggles all week long, going, oh, got all this stuff going on in my life, can't deal with it. When actually, if you'd have applied the message that you heard two or three weeks ago, a month ago, yesterday, if you'd have applied that into your life, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in now. Or, are you someone that actually gives something into the church? You don't just turn up just to be blessed and like to hang out with people and be like, yeah, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm all right. And then you go home and you're like, no, I'm not all right. What's that? I'm all right. I'm an idiot. Do you come and do you contribute something? Yeah? And it doesn't have to be anything big and major. All right? So don't think that, you know, you have to be like on the stage you know, as part of the band, or a preacher, or, you know, the, 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 the handsome notices giver, or anything like that. <coughs> Alright, you don't, I'm not saying that. But when you come to church, or when you're part of the church, okay, not just on a Sunday, but through the week, do you give something back? Yeah? Do you help clean up the rubbish? Do you go and pray for someone? You go and help people out with, you know, a fiver in their pocket if they need, you know, if they're a bit hard up. Do you go out and, like, have fellowship with people to encourage them and to build them up and to, you know, exhibit and display God's love through your life into their lives? This is the question that, really, I want to ask you guys. Are you a contributor or are you a consumer of church? I really believe that most of the problems that see, we see in the world today, you know, problems like poverty, loneliness, depression, wars that go on, all the selfishness that we see, gossip, slander, hate, all these things. I mean, the, the list goes on and on, yeah? You look around at the world we live in, and we all know that this is not a nice world to live in. We can all look, even within our neighbourhoods, and see... You know, the, the sin and the destruction that is all around us, everywhere. I really believe that we're in this state because God's people are not using the gifts and the talents and the skills that he has given to us. We haven't done anything for them. He's given them to us. And we're not using them. We're not using them in the way that he intended us to use them. We might use them for our own selfish ambition. Or we might use them just to glorify our own name and to make ourselves look good. You might serve, you know, teas and coffees and stuff to be like, check me out. Yeah? I had the best tea and coffee in the world. Because I do. Or, well, do you get what I'm saying? So I think it's time for God's church to rise up. To rise up. For God's people to rise up. To discover who they are in Christ. And to go out and to make a difference in the world that we live in. Because we can. We're called to be salt and light. <coughs> yeah, We're called to be the preservers of morality in this world. That's what salt does. It's a preservation tool. Yeah, Before fridges and freezers, they used to use salt to keep the meat from going off. Yeah? We're called to be light. We're called to shine Jesus' light into all the world so that people can see there is a different way of life. There is a better way of life. There's one that is not full of vain conceit. 
that's the people God's calling us to be. He's calling us to bless. So, for all that, we'll have a look at what the Bible says a little bit, shall we? Yeah? I really particularly like this, I'll spit my words out, uh, version of the Message Bible, all right, of Ephesians 2. I'll read it all out, but really I want to focus on just a little bit. It says, Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. That is God creating us to love us, as we've already talked about. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and saving. And this is the bit that I really want you to pay attention to. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. The good work he has gotten ready for us to do. Work we had better be doing. You turn the page. The same thing, different version of the Bible. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God's prepared these good works for us to do. We don't have to prepare them ourselves. God has already prepared them and laid them out in our lives to do. We've got to do it. That's, that's all we've got to do. We've just got to do it. He's done everything. We've just got to do it. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. <coughs> These gifts have been given to us. We should use the gifts that he's given us to serve others. Not ourselves, not our ego, not to glorify our name, but to serve others. So, blessing, right? Living out your calling, doing whatever it is God's called you to do actually does have benefits to it. It's not just do, 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 and you work your ass into the ground and like you end up you know, sweaty and worn out. and Yeah, all that's true. But it's not just yeah, a, a fruitless task. There are actually benefits for you yourself yeah, by doing this. Because this is the way God's created it all. Yeah, he's created us to be people that can go on and enjoy it doing the things that he's called us to do, yeah? Because there is great joy and satisfaction in it. If Forbes magazine, which I don't know if any of you know, is a, a leading magazine in America, Forbes is the company that puts out the Fortune 500 list every year, okay? It's a big economic uh, magazine or company that, that shows and tells the world who the top 500 richest and best companies are in the world. They do a lot to do with economics, <coughs> and business growth, and leadership, and all that kind of thing. But they went out and they did a study, all right, based upon volunteering your time. And they said, volunteering has always been viewed as good for your soul. Now it turns out that it's also good for your health and your career. Recent research conducted by Washington, DC-based Corporation for National and Community Service, reveals that charitable work literally makes the heart grow stronger. Individuals with coronary artery disease who participate in volunteer activities after suffering a heart attack report a reduction in despair and depression and that, in turn, drives down mortality and adds years to your life. It's also true that those who volunteer have fewer incidents of heart disease in the first place. Incredible. The secular people of the world are learning God's principles without ever ready, reading the Bible. By serving, by living out your calling, by doing this, you live longer. You have a stronger heart. Like belonging, when we looked at a couple of weeks ago. 
you live longer, you have less chance of health you know, problems and stuff like that. Incredible, isn't it, that God has set all this up in the first place for us to do, and we all struggle and strive and like have all these problems, when if we actually realised the truth of the matter, and did exactly what God's word calls us to do, we reap so much benefit from it. Other good things that come from volunteering, yeah, is whether we satisfy our religiously convicted morals or humanistic urges, volunteering leads us to a more fulfilled lifestyle. Oftentimes, we are the benefactors of someone else's kindness and hard work. Naturally, we possess the desire to show our own altruism through serving others. Many of us have the desire to serve as an example for others to follow. In regards to volunteering, this trait proves ever useful, as mentors are always welcome in the volunteer world to provide insight and information for someone whose shoes you were in not long ago. Right? It's true, isn't it? Yeah? We look at, you know, volunteering and stuff like that, maybe even before we were Christians, or even as Christians, we're like, okay, volunteering actually makes us feel better. Yeah? When you go out of your way to help someone, you actually feel good about it, right? Say you're walking down the street and a little old lady falls over in front of you. You're the first person there, you run up to her, because you're a good Christian. And you help her up, alright, back onto her feet, <coughs> dust her down a little bit, and she says, Oh, thank you very much, young person. You're so nice and kind. And you walk away and you're like, Yeah, look at me. <laughs> Done my good deed for the day. But you do, you feel better about it about helping people out, yeah? We are the benefactors of other people's kindness. How often does that happen? That random person that comes up and, and says a kind word, that random person that gives you some money, that random person that, you know, helped you when you fell over in the street and you scuffed your knee as a seven-year-old kid, right? And they pick you up, dust you down and send you on your way. And you're like, oh, that was nice. Wonder if I can do that for someone else, because you've received it. You want to then go out and do it, and to be an example for others to follow. Don't we all want to be a good example? Yeah, to our families, to our children, to our work colleagues, to those in college that we knock about with. Don't we all actually want them to see us as the people that you know they would like to to follow? Yeah, no one wants to be seen as the scumbag. Even the scumbags don't want to be seen as the scumbags. The scumbags want to be seen as I'm the geezer. Yeah, I'm hard. And they want to have people be like them. I don't go. I'm a scumbag. Let's try and create more scumbags just like me. No, they don't. They think they're doing the right thing, but we know they're not. But would it be better if we are? the best example for others to follow, yeah? Through our calling, through our helping others, serving others, whichever way God's called us to. When it comes to money as well, thinking about all this volunteering, that's of your time, that's of your talents, but of your money as well. There's a study done, several studies done. One guy, Robert Frank, says, People do not spend their extra money in ways that yield significant and lasting increases in measured satisfaction. In short, what he's actually saying is, more money doesn't make you more happy. A certain level of money, yeah, it makes you a certain <laughs> level of happy. But any more than that certain <coughs> level of money doesn't make you more happy. Does that make sense? If you think of it on a chart, like on a graph, yeah, if you've got no money, you're not happy. But if you've got some money, you're a bit happy. And when you hit a certain threshold, for example, a study was done, it's about £30,000 a year, okay, if you start earning that amount of money, okay, and you're earning £30,000 a year, that's about the happiest that you'll be. You could go on and earn £60,000 a year, and you'll be just as happy as if you was earning £30,000 a year. 
True story. Elizabeth Dunn says uh, that people are happier longer when they spend money on others than themselves. A study was done. They give people lots of money. You know, like some $5, some $20. This was done in America. But then they actually went around the world and, and did it in other nations as well. Just to see whether it was just an American trend or a humanistic nature. Well, they gave these people the money. And some of them they said, go and spend the money on yourself. <coughs> And then they said to so some of the others, go and spend money on somebody else. And at the end of the day, they phoned them back. And those that spent the money on their selves had forgotten about it. It was like, a, you know, yeah, it was nice. I bought a burger and chips, whatever. But those that spent the money on other people, even by the end of the day, several hours after the fact happened, were like, yeah, yeah, I did something good today. I feel pretty good about myself. The bottom line is, is that when we give, whatever it is, time, money, whatever, we live longer and have a greater joy, and that is even without the spiritual rewards that we get from God. Looking at the spiritual rewards in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This life doesn't end in this life. We all know that. It goes on forever. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. There will be rewards for those Christians that have lived out the life that God has called them to live. Yes, we all will enjoy the benefits of eternal life with God. But the Bible clearly tells us that those that live out the will of the Father faithfully will get extra rewards. True story. People might say, well, that's not very Christian. Well, I don't know. God wrote the Bible. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He knows what we are like as people. He knows that we respond better to rewards. So he rewards us. Yeah, because I found, like the other day, I was at um, Steve's and Linda's, and it said, um, something about getting, getting the desires of your heart. Yeah. If you do something, I don't know what it was. Yeah, search after the things of the kingdom, and it will give you the desire of your heart. It's like it's, it, it almost is like um, we start with like a, a drive of greed to do stuff for God. But essentially, when we first become Christians, isn't that the case? When we first become Christians, isn't it all about me? Look at what God's done for me, you know, I must be like amazing because God saved me, yeah, thank you God for looking after me, oh, me, 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 and then we progress on to, oh, thank you Jesus, it's all about you, Jesus, you're so good, love you Jesus, it's not about me, it's about you, I just want to be in your presence, I want to get my face before you. And then, as we go longer, we go, God's kingdom is so good. I just want to serve God's kingdom because it's all about the kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. But I want to serve you in your kingdom and do the things that you would have me do because it's all about your kingdom. And that's how it goes. True story, right? It's up to you to decide which stage of that you're actually in right now, okay? But those are definitely three stages of Christian growth and maturity. So, moving on. Mate, when I listen back to these things, I'm so conscious. I say the word so all the time. I reckon I should have like a, a so jar, right? <laughs> Every time someone catches me saying so or right then, I should put some money into the so jar. That was a bad idea. Why did I just say that? <laughs> so, 1 Corinthians. <laughs> there you go, that's another 50p. <laughs> Now, if I say 50p, I should have made it like a penny. Yeah. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort or what quality of work each one has done. 
If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Just think about that for a minute. You build upon a foundation already set. Christ laid the foundation. Yeah? Christ is the rock upon which we build everything. We all know the parable of the man that built his house with sticks and a man that had built his house of bricks. And a house of sticks was huffed and it was puffed and it was blown down by the winds. Foolish man. Oh, this is a three little pigs. It's close. <laughs> It's not the same. No, but we're getting into fairy tales in the next few weeks anyway. So, uh, there's another 50p. <laughs> then, <laughs> the work that we do, okay, does bear us a reward of some kind. It's up to you how much reward you would like in eternity. It's entirely up to you. You can be a person that, that works and you could sweat and you could get worn out and you could just get to the end of this life and pass through the fire just as one that passes through fire. And yeah, you'll have an eternity with God. And yeah, I think it'll be pretty good, actually. However, you can live out the will of God in your life. And you can choose to use what God has gifted you with to best serve Him with the right heart, with the right motivation mind, because it's all got to be about the heart. But you do it with the right heart and the right motivation, and God could place you in charge of ten cities. I think that sounds pretty cool, personally. But it's up to you what you do. What you do with your talents will determine what you get at the end. And remember, like I said at the beginning, it doesn't have to be something big. You don't have to be a preacher on the stage. You don't have to be you know, in a worship band or serving the best tea and coffee in the world. It can be something that nobody sees. The thing that God has called you to might just be that you get no recognition from anybody, but God will recognise you. It might just be that you will just do it in secret, in silence, and no one need know anything about it. But that day will come when it will be fully disclosed, when you go through the fire. You might be an amazing prayer warrior that just locks yourself in a closet every day. You get on your face before God and you pray for hours and hours. And your prayers might very well change the world that you live in. You might be the person that stays behind after church on a Sunday and you see the little bits of foam bobble that you know come out of the bean bags and everyone else buggered off and left it. And you could be that person that goes around and picks it all up but it's in the bin. No one knows anything about it. But God's seen it. It'll be disclosed on the final day. You might be that person that puts you know, money in the offering to help someone out. No one knows about it. It's a gift from God. But that'll be disclosed because God's seen it. So it doesn't have to be a big thing that people would regard as being a big thing. But it's no less important, wherever it is, as long as you're doing what God has called you to do and you're living it out with your life, you will receive eternal benefits and you will also see the fruit, maybe, in this life of what your work has done and achieved. You may not think that it's doing very much now. Abraham didn't see the fruit of his promise. But now look at it. 4,000 years on, there are 2 billion people in this world that call themselves Christian, that trace 
their roots back to Abraham being faithful with what God had called him to do. And what had God called him to do? Every man's dream. Have sex with his wife. Awkward moment. True story though, isn't it? I just heard it like the, the have sex with his wife part. <laughs> okay, so the big question. We'll come back to it. So, what can you do to be a blessing or a contributor to the kingdom of God? Or are you just going to be a consumer? The choice is yours. We'll go through some of the questions now, shall we? And have a look at what I mean, or what I wrote, and then we'll answer them. Does everyone have a copy of the questions? Let's pass some. <coughs> yeah, pass them there. I think everyone's got a copy now, then, yeah? <laughs> so, these questions will help you you don't know what it is that God's actually called you to, okay, if you are one of those people that is really not sure, and I think most of us have been at this point at one place or another, then I pray that these will help you to discover what God's actually called you to. If you do know what God's called you to, thank God, yeah, but let's just go through this. So what are your passions? What are the things? What are the things that you actually get excited about? <coughs> Mate, it could be you get excited about sport. It could be you get excited about stamps. A bit weird, but you might. Yeah? It might be that you get excited about food, you might get excited about, you know, just helping people up and down stairs. It might be that you get excited about washing little old people. It, it, whatever it is. Whatever it is that you get excited about. What is your passion? It can be more than one thing. It can be more than one thing. All right? Don't answer them yet. Things. We'll go through the questions first. Yeah. And we'll all, all answer the questions. What frustrates you? What is that thing when you walk into a room, or you walk into an environment, and you're like, Ah! Oh, I don't believe that that statuette isn't like... It's not just right. It's off. <laughs> or you walk into church on a Sunday morning and all the chairs are like in a row but then there's the one wonky one. And you're like, oh, I've got to put that right. Because you've got OCD or something with chairs. Or is it everyone standing around talking and no one's like helping whoever it is in the kitchen with the washing up? Is that the thing that frustrates you? It can be anything. Actually, it can be anything. What frustrates you? Is it that person keeps going... <coughs> <coughs> that could be the thing that frustrates you. Alright? So what frustrates you? What are you good at? Not what you think you're good at. Alright? Not what you wish you was good at. But what are you good at? You might be good at wiping little kids' noses. Yeah? Stopping them crying. You might be good at washing, washing up. You might be good at hoovering. You might be good at giving money away. You might be good at making food. You might be good at fashion. You might be good at sport. You might be good at games. You might be good at whatever, whatever it is. What are you good at? Actually good at. You might be good at music. Don't want to leave the musicians out. So, what are you good at? Four. If you could do anything, anything without boundaries or having to think about responsibilities, what would it be? So, for example, you might think in your head right now, if, if I didn't have to do this for a living, right? if I could earn enough money by doing this thing that I could live by it, yeah, what would it be? If you could do anything and you knew that you couldn't fail, what would it be? Because I know that quite a lot of the time, 
we grow up thinking, <coughs> I'd love to do this, I'd love to do that. But then as you get older, you realise that that job just makes no money. There's no way you can devote that much time to doing the thing that you're very passionate about because it won't pay the bills. It won't set you up for life. So you forget about it. You put it on the shelf, you put it to one side and think, oh, maybe I'll do it later. But if you could do anything, regardless of the responsibilities that you might have in life, if you could do anything, what would that thing be? Number five is, what is the thing that makes you happiest in life? What makes you happy? Does it make you happy to cook people food? Does it make you happy to wipe little kids' noses or to stop them crying? Does it make you happy to play sport? Does it make you happy to give your money away? Whatever it is, what makes you happiest in life? What brings you the most joy? It might just be playing an instrument. It might just be sitting on your backside. But what makes you happiest in life? And then finally, what thing in the world makes you sad? What makes you sad about the world that we live in? It might be there's so many poor people around. It might be the starving children in Africa. It might be the fact that there's not enough coffee in the kitchen. <laughs> All right. Whatever it might be. All right, guys, do you, do you all get what I mean by these questions? Yeah? I, I hope I've filled it out a little bit and it kind of makes a bit of sense to you. I'm going to stop recording. We're going to pray. All right? And then we're going to answer the questions. All right? For yourselves. And then maybe afterwards, if we want to, we'll all talk about it and try and discover what it is that God's called us to do in this life. Does that all make sense? Is that all good? Yeah? Let's pray. Say, Father God, we thank you that you are a God that loves us so much. That you've given us everything that we need to be able to fulfil exactly what it is that you want us to do on this earth. You've called us from, from darkness into light. To be children of light. To be salt in the world. I just pray, Father God, that you just empower each of us just to live the lives that you've called us to do. That you give us the, the knowledge and the wisdom to apply the teachings that we hear regularly into our lives, that we might just be the people you've called us to be. We thank you that we are loved. We thank you that we belong to your body. We thank you that you are transforming us and renewing our minds day by day by the power of your spirit and the power of your word. Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you just help us to be people that will bless others, that will serve others that will get a sense of satisfaction out of the calling that you've called us to so father god help us i pray answer these questions and discern your will for our lives that we might be fruitful people for the glory of your name amen